Hello, and welcome to our program, Astronomy for Everyone. With me here in the studio tonight is a special guest that will be telling us all about her adventures at Space Camp. Rebecca, welcome to the program. Thanks. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Now, when did you first start getting interested in space? I first started getting interested in space when my grandfather, John Blum, who's an astronomer, would take me stargazing at night. We would look through telescopes. I think I was around two. And ever since then, I've loved space and astronomy. Just been something that's just come naturally to you. I guess, <laughs> I guess yeah. <laughs> now, I hear you've been to space camp more than once. Yeah, I actually went for my fifth time this year. I was at Advanced Space Academy. And the first time I went, I, was, I did the family camp with my dad and my brother. And then I did Aviation Challenge. Um, and then I did the Advanced Space Academy, which I did this year. I was in a group named Acidalia, which is named after one of the planes on Mars. And uh, the group was full of teenagers from uh, around the U.S. who were my age. Okay. And it was around 20 of us, and it was great like always. It was so much fun. Now, what type of experiences do you have at Space Camp with the rest of the kids? So one of the best parts about Space Camp are these simulated missions. So what they do is they have a giant room, which is full of pretend space shuttles with cockpits full of um, different buttons. And they also have uh, sort of like simulated mission control rooms. And everyone's given a uh, job, which is like based off one of the jobs in the real mission control or real uh, space shuttle. And you have uh, like headsets that are connected with everybody else's headset so you can communicate and you also have a script with a list of things that need to be done at certain times and but that's not it there's also these anomalies that occur which are things that happen sort of out of the blue for example on um, uh, the the last mission I went on at advanced space camp which was the Mars mission the flight director got a heart attack and died yeah <laughs> Oh, but that would be unexpected, yes. Yes. Uh, yes. So, yeah, we had, to com we had to communicate and figure out how to uh, work around the challenge, and that was really great. They also have things such as a giant pretend Canada arm, and you're dressed in a space suit, and you go out on the Canada arm. It's like 30 feet in the air, so that's really cool. They also have, like, different um, simulations you can go on. Have you seen, um, like, pictures of kids, I guess, strapped in these, like, circular devices like this? Yes. And they spin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's a multi-axis trainer. So that's one of the simulations we go on. There's also um, the one six gravity chair, which simulates walking on the moon. And we also go to a lot of uh, lectures, which are really interesting on different topics about space. Yeah. And we also uh, just do a lot of team bonding and uh, like ropes courses. We, there's like a woods nearby, and there's ropes courses and rock climbing and ziplining. That's interesting that they throw something un unexpected into your scripted oh, yeah. program to see how you can react under pressure or just something dropping in. Because I'm sure in real life at JPL and NASA, stuff like that happens. Yeah, and they can be the craziest things. Another thing that happened was um, we just saw on the screen one of our uh, like crewmates, I guess, was just like on the floor. Like, we didn't know what was going on, and that was the same time our flight director was having a heart attack. And so um, someone actually had to take over the position of flight director, and we had all the Michigan uh, mission specialists running around, and we also had someone's, like, legs getting, like, torn off. Oh, <laughs> and, no. Yeah. <laughs> it gets really crazy. So it's really, the communication is oh really important. But at the end, you feel just so accomplished with your group. It's really... Like, as you mentioned, a bonding exercise. To yeah. Work together yeah. as a team. Yeah, and working together also is one of the biggest themes about Aviation Challenge, which is the, another program at Space Camp, which focuses more on the milita military and Air Force and flying planes. So we do a lot of survival training there, so building fires and uh, learning how to filter water. And there's also different simulations on Space Camp. There's a simulation that's a water rescue where you are simulated like dropping uh, like a plane crash and you're like in the ocean and then a helicopter uh, emergency rescues you and that's a lot of fun and then there's instead of the missions with the shuttle and mission control at space camp at aviation challenge you do missions 
in like a, a plane's cockpit. Yeah. Oh, okay. So it sounds like a, a well-rounded program, a lot yes. of different experiences while you're there. Mm -hmm. So while you're there, what's it like living there? Okay, so there's these habitats. And as you can see, they look they're sort of like modeled off of a space station. For example, inside, instead of saying restrooms, it'll say waste management <laughs> and, yeah, and different stuff like that. Oh, sure. So these places are where you live for the, the week mm -hmm. that you're there? And yeah, you, you uh, dorm with other uh, people your age. Okay. Yeah. All right. And you spend the whole week there. You, you guys hang out in those things when you're not doing your official space You're camp always stuff? busy, but yes, yeah. <laughs> actually, um, my group, uh, well, in my room, there was another girl's room nearby, and we're not supposed to be out past, like, a certain time, but we wanted to go to the other room, so we tried to, like, sneak into the other room. Like, just, like, to talk and stuff with the other girls, we, we got in trouble. Okay. <laughs> but, yeah. It sounds like a mm -hmm. typical camp thing. I yeah. remember when I was in band camp when I was in high school, we'd nice. kind of do the same thing, mm -hmm. so. Now, uh, what was your favorite activity or experience while you were there? I'd have to say the scuba diving. So that was something I've never done before. So it was a really great experience. And because did you know how to swim before you did? Yes, yeah. Okay. They make sure. They make sure you okay. have to do a swim test. But it's really cool because other astronauts, when they're training, actually go through scuba diving because it simulates as much of a microgravity environment as possible on Earth. Okay. Sure. So simulate what it's like in space. So what we did is for an hour, so there was instruction on how to breathe um, through the masks and also how to clear water from your goggles if you get water in them. And then at the bottom of, it was a giant pool at the bottom of like this 20 foot pool, we played basketball and waved at like the kids outside because there was like was clear glass windows. And, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So it's just like being at SeaWorld. You can look through the yeah. glass, only you, you guys are the, okay, that's interesting to, uh, to be able to do that. And of course, I guess they spent time teaching how to do it right. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, was there a little bit of trepidation about that for the first time? Yes. One thing I was really nervous about was everyone who went before told me, like, you're, it's going to hurt your ears, like, really badly, or, like, don't hold your breath because it could hurt your lungs. And so I was really nervous, uh -huh. and I almost, like, panicked underwater. But um, the instructors were really good at teaching you how to scuba dive, and you just feel so accomplished when you get to the bottom. Again, something else you haven't done before, you mm -hmm. kind of overcome some fear yeah. a bit to uh, accomplish this. Oh, that's interesting. Now, what might surprise people about space camp? I would have to say the friendships that you make in just one week. I never thought you could get so close to people in a week and I'm still in touch with people from years ago. Yeah. So okay, I was going to ask you that if you still yeah, in contact yeah. going back years. Yeah. yeah. So and then there's also um, it's really cool how people any age can go. I think most people think it's just for people my age, but they also have um, adult programs or in like teacher programs for a weekend, and they have uh, the family camp, which I went to when I was younger. So it's anyone can go really. Oh, okay. So even somebody like me could go. Yeah. Oh, yes, I cool. recommend it. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. Now, uh, are you going to go back next year? You know, I, I want to because um, my Acidalia group this year, a lot of the kids are planning to all go back the same week, and I really want to be part of that. But um, I'm really hoping to do um, Possum Academy. And oh, what's that? Uh, so Possum Academy is a program at Embry-Riddle University in Florida for around a week, and it's like a really intense space camp, astronaut training program. So, okay. yeah, what it is is they have um, uh, G4 simulators that you go in, and it's like a real plane. Like, okay. yeah, it's not just a simulator. It's a plane. And they also have uh, uh, training for, uh, like, flight suits and stuff like that. And there's a big emphasis on learning about, like, the atmosphere. And, okay. uh, yeah, you learn a lot, so I'm really excited. It sounds like it's taking it a bit to the next level. Yeah especially leaning towards the astronaut part. Mm -hmm. That sounds like that would be quite interesting. I can see how you might be torn to want to be with your friends yeah. and yet wanting to take this next step, if you will, um, at the uh, space camp. So we're going to take a real quick break. Um, 
If you have a question, you can send us an email. Uh, the address, of course, you can see at the bottom of your screen, as always. And coming up next is Term of the Month, and we'll be right back after that. Stephen? The Term of the Month, the right stuff. The book and the movie by this name covered test pilots like Chuck Yeager and the Mercury 7 astronauts. The right stuff is about a seat of a seat of the pants approach with a macho can-do attitude. Astronauts will tell you that to go into space you have to be smart enough to get the job done and dumb enough to actually do it. The original test pilots were often engineers who knew the systems enough to anticipate the kinds of things that might go wrong. How to become an astronaut? We learn by doing. You might go to scan space camp www.spacecamp.com. Then go to school for a, a focused, advanced degree. Submit your application and keep submitting it. Term of the month, the right stuff. Back to you, Don. Thanks, Stephen. And welcome back to the program. With me here in the studio is our special guest, Rebecca Blum, talking to us about Space Camp and some other interesting topics as well. So, Rebecca, you're telling me that you want to be an astronaut. Tell us about that. Yes. Well, I wanted to be an astronaut ever since I was really little. Um, I would like to be a biologist um, and see how the body reacts to space. Yeah. Okay. And so you'll be going to uh, college not this year, but next year? Mm -hmm. Okay, this is your senior year in high school. Okay. Junior. Oh, junior year. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. All righty. Uh, so then after that, once you get into college, you'll be focusing on biology. Then once you get past your basics. The first mm, biology or medicine. Biology. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. I know they've been doing a lot of study on what space does to the body. I know the uh, they did that study with uh, the, the twin astronauts yeah. to see how the the DNA would change after mm -hmm. a year in space. So uh, yeah, it's it's crazy. I mean, they really need that information um, for long Mars missions or other missions that are going to take place. They need to know how the body is going to react. So I know they even talk about you know the, the exercises that they have to do even mm -hmm. on the on the space station. Yeah. And uh, so yeah, biology would uh, be a very important thing to know to have somebody with an astronaut with that uh, background. And um, so how might having this knowledge make it easier? They would know what to expect or how to design equipment, perhaps, to protect the human body? Or Well, yeah. I mean, just knowing, I guess, what could happen to your body in space, they could try to figure out a way to prevent that from happening or making it less of an issue. But, I mean, I know that Everyone says it's really tough to be an astronaut, but luckily there's so many private companies out there, such as SpaceX and Blue Origin and Virgin Atlantic. Sure. I, I think it's going to be a lot easier to um, become an astronaut, and there's going to be a lot more job openings. And they don't—they need people besides astronauts. Again, like people to um, design the spaceships, and also scientists on the ground to see maybe how the body reacts in space and other experiments so so uh, speaking of studying and, and going on in biology and that that's all part of the stem curriculum that is very big these days so um, how are you uh, impressing upon your peers the importance of stem I, I assume you're doing that because mm -hmm. you seem very dedicated to this thanks um, I in the past year started the Beyond Earth Space Club at my school and this club is aimed at getting kids excited about STEM and also about space exploration. Okay. So um, the club has, when we have our weekly meetings, club members give presentations on an aspect of space they find interesting. For example, we had presentations on how the body reacts in space. We had presentations on the ISS and uh, a cool space elevator, Messier objects, so a lot of different things to educate people okay. in the club. And then we also open, uh, uh, had a planetarium show that was open to the whole community. Um, so anyone could come in for free and learn about the night sky. And we're also planning this year, we hope to visit elementary and middle schools and give talks to inspire kids about, uh, to get 
excited about space and hopefully seeing uh, an older student interested in space, though that I think that will inspire them a lot. We also are um, hoping to get uh, guest speakers in from the private sector to speak at school assemblies. So, yeah. It's that's good. I, with my, my job at the Michigan Science Center, STEM is a very important thing there. And they're especially trying to target girls from fourth to seventh or eighth grade when statistics show that they start falling away from mm -hmm. that. Somehow it's perceived that all that's just for boys. And I'm really excited to see young women, you know, stepping up and helping women see that this is for everybody. And of course, in your group, it can be male or female, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's no distinction there, mm -hmm. which is good, but especially for young women to keep them in the sciences and, and not think it's not for them, because mm -hmm. it certainly is, as we can see by just talking to you today. Now, you founded the Beyond Earth Space Club. Uh, can you tell our viewers how this is different, say, from the Ford Club that myself and your grandfather belong mm -hmm. to? So while both clubs um, want people uh, to become interested in space who might not normally have been and talk about different space astronomy topics, the main difference is the Beyond Earth Space Club. Um, its focus is to help um, children apply STEM skills to the next wave of space exploration, whether that's in their careers or another aspect of their lives. Um, so yeah, that's the main difference. We just want to get people really excited about space. Okay. Um, are you planning any type of outreach work? Uh, you talked about visiting schools, so is, is mm -hmm. that part of what the club will be doing? Mm -hmm. Yes, visiting schools, also trying to have more stargazing events that, that's open to everybody and planetarium shows like we did last year. Okay. Uh, will we be doing some of that through Cranbrook? That's where yes, you go, yeah? yes. Uh, Cranbrook has a planetarium, so we use that, and they have some open fields that we can use for stargazing events. And Great. Plus the observatory that's mm -hmm. there too, yes, yes. which is very cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I enjoy being in, in there myself. So, you've talked about what you're doing with the club. Um, as some of your club members get a little bit older and you guys start to move out into college and other things, what's the future of well, your club? Right now, uh, my partner Daisy and I, we started the uh, Beyond Earth Space Club. We really want to see the club spread to other schools. And we think that'll, again, really help get people excited about space. So the way we're planning to spread it to other schools is we created this flash drive that has everything you need to start the club at your school. And it, it, its goal is to make it really easy to start. So there's documents in it um, with lists of fun activities to do. There's PowerPoints that you can show to student council to help get it passed. And also instructions on how to really uh, make the first meeting great, things like that. And right now we already have requests from f um, schools in five different states who want the uh, well, flash drive. Yeah, we're going to be sending them out tomorrow, and the requests keep coming in. Yeah. Terrific. So they'll work with uh, a mentor at their particular school, most likely a science teacher, I would assume, mm -hmm. to help them organize the program and uh, run it. That's, that's great because it's kind of one of the things uh, at the Ford Club that we are concerned about is that when we look around the room, they're, they all look like me, older, you know, and we're concerned about where are the young people, mm -hmm. where's the next generation. We got excited about Sputnik mm -hmm. and Telstar and all of that stuff going way back. And so we're hoping that we see the next generation come up and take our place and, and carry it forward. Mm -hmm. And I, I think this, uh, what you're doing and your, you know, your fellow students is great. This Thanks. is really great. Mm -hmm. So uh, moving forward as you get into your career and get into college uh, with biology, um, you still plan on staying active in, uh, in astronomy? Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that's where I started looking at the night sky with my grandpa. So it's always going to be special to me, and I love coming to the, the stargazing events. So. Okay, you're going to be at Astronomy at the Beach? Yes, of Arena? course, and I'm bringing space, uh, Beyond Earth Space Club people, too. Okay, yep. Mm -hmm. Which, by the time they see this, will have been last month, but that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great event, and uh, we'll look forward to, uh, to seeing you there. Uh, any final thoughts about 
space camp or, or STEM that you'd like to share with our Well, you said that um, you really hope that uh, the n this next generation will be into space, just like how your generation was. But I, I mean, I think there's good news because so many people, I think, are really interested in space. I mean, beyond just going to space camp where everyone is, you know, people who've been asking for these flash drives, um, I mean, there's been a lot of people, and I think that there's gonna, the next uh, generation is really going to get involved in space. I think they're already pretty excited. I think so. So, Rebecca, how can people get information to start their own astronomy club? Well, what they can do is they can uh, email the email below, which is the email for the Ford Astronomy Club, and I'll send a flash drive to them, and they can send a flash drive to whoever wants to start a club. All right, good. Well, that makes it fairly simple, mm -hmm. so uh, I'm sure that they'll look forward to getting that information. I want to thank you for being on the show with us today. It's been a real pleasure. And uh, if you'd like to get more information, please contact or take a look at our website. The address is down at the bottom of the screen, as always. And coming up next with What's Up in the Night Sky, Stephen Witte. Stephen. Thanks, Don. What's up in the night sky for October 2018? The sun rises from 7.30 to 8 over the month and sets from 7.15 to 6.30 p.m. over the month. And if you do the math, that's this, the days get shorter by an hour and a half, at least here in Michigan, over the course of the month. Twilight is uh, you know, ends an hour and a half before sunrise and it starts uh, an hour and a half after uh, the sun sets. So astronomical night is the time in between. That's the darkest part of the sky. The third quarter moon is on the second. The new moon is on the eighth. The first moon, uh, the first quarter moon is on the 16th. And the full moon is on the 24th. And then in a reprise, we have on the 31st, a first quarter of uh, third quarter moon again. Mercury goes uh, through Virgo and Scorpius. Uh, here it's at the beginning of the month, um, at, uh, you know, early in the morning. It sets at 7.30 to 7.15 p.m. over the course of the month. It is best at the end of the month um, uh, and aphelion, which is when uh, Mercury is closest to the sun, uh, that is on the 16th. Venus goes from Libra to Virgo and sets at uh, basically 8 p.m. and rises at the end of the month at 7.40 a.m. That is, in between there is an inferior conjunction uh, Venus crosses the sun between uh, Venus, you know, Venus goes between the sun and the earth, and that's on the 26th. So Venus is still quite close to the sun at the end of the month. Uh, that's why it's best at the beginning. Jupiter is in Libra. It sets from 9 to 7.30 p.m. over the month. It's best at the beginning of the month, uh, a half hour after sunset. Saturn is in Sagittarius. It sets at 11.30 to 7.30 p.m. over the month. It's also best at the beginning of the month, and it's also best a half hour after sunset. Mars is in Capricornus. It sets from 2 a.m. to 1.30 a.m. It's best at the beginning of the month. Um, it uh, is also best from 9.30 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. over the course of the month. That's when it's highest in the sky. Then we finally go to Uranus, Neptune, and Mars. So we have Mars again. That's the same Mars we're looking at. Uranus is in Aries. It rises at eight, uh, from 8 p.m. to 6 p.m. over the course of the month, and it's best 
uh, during twilight, um, that is that astronomical night that I'm talking about. Um, Uranus is in opposition, I can, you could say all month, it's basically up all night, uh, but opposition is a point in time, it happens on the 23rd of October. So this is the month, if you want to try to see Uranus with just your eyeball, what I recommend is having a good sky chart, finding it in a telescope or even binoculars, it's not that, not that dim, it's, you know, binoculars are good enough, and then uh, once you have found it, uh, then see if you can find the star patterns around it with just your eyeball and see if you can spot it. it uh, requires a steady head and looking at it long enough to get get that fainter light and you need a dark sky sight to see uh, Uranus with just your eyeball. October is usually the best month to do it. Uh, that doesn't change much because Uranus doesn't move across the sky very much during the course of a lifetime. So uh, October <laughs> at the moment is the best time to try this. And I've done it. It's wonderful. Uh, it's a wonderful challenge. Neptune is in Aquarius, where it has been and will be, like, for the rest of your life. Uh, it sets at 5.30 to 3.30 p.m. Um, anyway, it's best at midnight. Oh, that must be sets at a.m. Anyway, it's best at midnight to 10 p.m. over the course of the month. Um, so that's, that's Aquarius. There are two meteor showers, and the first is the better of the two. It's the Draconids, and they, are, they should be the best. Their peak is on the 8th, early in the um, evening. And that's because, and, and usually meteor showers are better in the morning, uh, you know, after midnight, basically. Uh, but this one is an exception because the radiant, which is the head of Draco the dragon, and so it's really close to the North Pole, um, the radiant is high in the sky in the evening, not, in the, not after midnight. So... Um, now, Draco is very far north, so this is really a northern hemisphere uh, shower. It's usually a sleeper, but every now and again the dragon roars, and it's really good when, when that happens. Uh, there is no moonlight, which is really good, so get, a, get to a dark sky site, dress warm, and like lie down and look up at the entire sky, not just the northern part, not just Draco. Uh, the entire sky is, is how to do it. But dress warm, this is October we're talking about. The Orionids uh, peak on the 21st, and they're best in the morning. But since there's a third quarter moon, there may only be a couple of hours before sunrise where, where you really can uh, see that. And so that is what's up in the night sky. Uh, remember, we don't charge for our show, but we may tax your brain. <laughs>